On your outline there, you notice some things about the church. This is all about the unification of the church, the unity that needs to be in the church. We're going to talk about some things tonight that are so important. So important. All right, the first thing, the calling of the church. The calling of the church is in verse 1. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. The calling. <clears throat> what is our calling? What does God call us to do and to be? Spread the gospel. To make disciples. What else? To be, to be peacemakers, right? I mean, we're really to be, if anything says about us, we ought to be more of a peacemaker. Even though, even though we realize there's some things, even Jesus himself sometimes divided people didn't he he divided families some trusted him some hated him some people wanted to love him or some people wanted to kill him so we realize that we carry a truth so i think one of the things that might be easier to say and, and i've pointed out five things here that go with that some other areas what we're called look at some of these first of all light bearers we're light bearers we're not the light you know Bible says, let our light so shine before men. But we're not the light, but we carry the light. It's like we're the candle. We're not the light. We're not the flame. We, we are to light the light of the world. We're to let Him shine. Uh, someone said it this way. Really, we're reflectors of that light. And that's why we're to be vessels that are clean, that reflect the light of Christ to the world wherever we go. And so, so remember that, Matthew 5, 16 shares that with us. Second of all, servants. This is part of our calling, to be light bearers, to be servants, it says in Matthew 20, verses 26 to 28. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Brewer this morning spoke about that, and Jesus taught us to be servants, didn't he? He said the, the ones in the front are going to be the ones who are actually put themselves in the back. The last shall be first. Those who serve will be first. And so time and again, he, we're told in Scripture uh, that we're, wherever we go, we're to bear the light, we're to be servants, and thirdly, we're to be witnesses. And you know, it's amazing, really, by bearing the light, by serving, you'll be a witness. You'll just naturally be a witness. Because th don't think people don't notice servants. People notice when somebody is willing to be a servant how important that is that we serve because it's not it's not natural what's natural is put yourself first <laughs> what's natural is it's you against the world what's natural is for you to think you're better than everybody else so when you're willing to lower yourself and serve others that's not natural that's supernatural that's a god thing and so and when you do that you're noticed and that makes you a witness. But now, we know this means uh, nobody got saved just because they saw you act good, act right. They need somebody to tell them. You know, it's by the foolishness of preaching, if you will, that people are saved. People need to hear how to be saved. They may see things you do and say, wow, I love what that person's doing. But they don't know how to get there. We've got to tell them how to get there. All right? So it's not enough just to do it. It's, so that's what the witness is. It's to talk about it. And then to be ministers wherever you go. 2 Corinthians 5.18 talks about how he's given us that ministry of, of uh, uh, well, we, we know Scripture, we're given the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, but here in 2 Corinthians uh, 5.18, let me pull that up and, and read it. These pages stick to par together so much. All right. Talks about if anyone, verse 17 is one that says, If anyone's in Christ, new creation, old things pass away, behold, all things become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us that ministry of reconciliation. And so it's so important. We are ministers of of God. We are His ministers wherever we go. We're, uh, we're called a uh, priesthood of believers uh, uh, over in, in 1 Peter. 
And that means that literally God has put us into the ministry, every one of us. Some ministries are paid positions, some are volunteer positions, but every one of us are expected to minister uh, wherever we go. All right? And then one more. Uh, priests. Similar. I always like to look at a priest as their job, at least in the Old Testament days, was to intercede for man, to, to take man by the hand and lead him to a holy God, to help him know that God. And that's really what God's told us to do. I mean, He's told us to find those that are lost and lead them to Christ. So we are, again, that holy priesthood, that royal priesthood that God has called us to do the work of the ministry. Okay? Any questions about that? Nope. Next thing. So if we're going to be unified, we've got to be unified around what we are to do and to be. Let me back up and say, which one of those are you? And how many of those are you? Are we to be? You know what I believe? I believe if a church will be those things, you'll have very few problems in the church. You'll have very few problems. You know when problems arrive? You know when problems arise? It's when we want our way. Or when we, when we want to put somebody else down. It might be because we don't like what they wore or the way they cut their hair or whatever the reason may be. But, but when we become an accuser of the brethren, the Bible says that that's what the old devil does, isn't it? Accuse the brethren. And that's not God. But see, when we do these things, our eyes are on the Lord and serving Him and not other people and other things. And uh, when a church gets in trouble, it's when it starts fighting for what it thinks is right and choosing sides, and that's not God. So, so think about our calling, what God's calling you to be, and then the character of the church. What is the characteristics? And this is somewhat, the, the first was kind of the roles that we play. And this is talking about some of the characteristics of the church. The first one, humility. Verse 2. Uh, I left my page. There we go. In verse 2 it says, with all, here's how we're to, uh, this is what the walking worthy of the calling. It says we do that with all lowliness and gentleness, okay? Lowliness or humility is what it's talking about. Not esteeming ourselves as better than others. Do you think most Christians today struggle with lowliness? It's so against what we are trained with, isn't it? I mean, really, we, we're, we're educated and got our careers and we're trying to advance in those careers and we're trying to get ahead. And, and, and everything in our society says it's about getting ahead. It's not about getting lower. It's not about humbling yourself. And usually trying to get ahead or think that we're better than somebody else is where all the problems begin, isn't it? It's when we sometimes, you know why, we, you know why people criticize other people? Because they're trying to make themselves look better. Did he say that? That's true, because you want yourself to look better. You don't tear other people down, you'll step on others to do it if you have to. Do what? That's easy preaching right there. Yeah, right. Been there, done that, been through that. Gentleness, to be. Look at the second thing. It says from lowliness to gentleness. Can I ask you, are you a gentle person? Thank y'all for being honest, some of you. Or do you raise your voice and scream at other people? Or do you, do you want to deal with people? Find fault, criticize. Be rough. Gentleness, again, like humility, it's one of those things that really... A gentle person says, get me out of the way. This is not about me. Gentleness says, I'm, I just want to bless somebody else. 
today. My mind is on blessing somebody else. Wouldn't a church be awesome if that's what it thought about all the time? How can I be a blessing to somebody else today? Not where you're wrong and you're wrong or I'm wrong or, or that person believes wrong. You know, I, to be honest, I, I, could, I could look at things. Let's say, the, let's say that Asbury Revival up there. And I could probably go through everything they're doing at Asbury Revival and I'd probably find some things I didn't like. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't agree with that. But all I can say right now is just, just get out of the way and let God do what God wants to do. It ain't about my way, what I think. It ain't about, you know, even at this point, it's definitely not about a, a doctrinal purity. Now, if they get up next week and say, we want to start worshiping Moloch in this place, you know, <laughs> we, want to, we want to offer burnt offerings to donkeys or whatever, you know, then somebody may have to step in and say, wait a minute, we've gotten off course here a little bit with this. But, but at this point... There's not a lot of doctrinal things. It's just a matter of saying, let's worship God. Let's just love on God and let God love on us, you know. And what mistakes may have been made have been made, uh, if they've been made, they've been made out of maybe ignorance or not out of a, a, a negative heart, you know. So just a, a gentleness that sometimes just says, back off back off and just relax and let God be God patience he mentions from he goes from long suffering I mean from lowliness to gentleness to long suffering and long suffering is translated patience in a lot of Bible translations uh, I'm sure when y'all go to bed at night you pray for patience right <laughs> yeah <laughs> Many times we don't want to pray for patience. A lot of people, I've heard people say, I don't pray for patience because the Lord will take you through some stuff and help you learn patience. <clears throat> but we need it, don't we? We need patience. We need to be long-suffering. You know, that's one of the greatest attributes of God is that He is long-suffering toward us. And that's what we ought to be. People don't act like we think they ought to act. We ought to be more long-suffering and less judgmental. Amen? We ought to be more wants to help than tear down. We ought to be more of want to. And, and the world out there. I saw a cute little clip today on Facebook. It was a couple of, a couple of uh, a black guy and a, a girl. And they were talking about, well, what about that person that's homosexual? What's the message to them? God loves you. Has a wonderful plan for your life. But he goes on, he says, toward the end of it, and he goes through a list of sins. But he gets down to the end and he says, now that you decided you want God to be your Savior, you want His love, now let's talk about making Him your Lord. And making Him Lord is going to require some repentance. And letting Him have His way in your life. Do you want to do that? Do you want let God to... You know, so it's not like, well, I can just take God and do what I want to do. No. You take God and then you get in line behind God and you follow God. Follow God's way. What God says is right and what God says is wrong. And I thought, how great, a great way to handle it. If you get a chance, go through and look at that. I thought it was a really unique way to uh, say, no matter where you are, you're a murderer. <clears throat> Whatever you've done, God loves you. Cares about you right where you are. Turn to Him. Listen to Him. See, that's got to be, that's who God is. God takes us. God accepts us where we are. Boy, if we could learn to do that. My, my philosophy I learned in ministry years ago is to accept people where they are. Now, if you start, if you're some, some of you probably saying, Brother Mike, you only accept some people where they're, I, I really do. I really do. Now, if you're attacking the Bible, if you're in some, you're some kind of liberal 
teacher and you know better, then, uh, you know, I, I don't have, I'm not going to just step in and say, oh, it's okay, it's all right. I'm saying, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. But there's some hills to die on out there. But, but I'm saying primarily where you are, we have to take people where they are and help lead them to where they need to be. You know where problems arise? It's when we refuse to take people where they are. We want to take them where they ought to be. They're not there. They're not there. We put people down all the time for different reasons. Different reasons we put them down. And we ought not do that, should we? And God says to be patient with people where they are. And I'll, I, you know, I'll admit that sometimes my patience wears thin. Hello? Last couple of weeks have been like that. I've just, I'm not long suffering enough. Well, I'm, I, I may be long suffering, but I'm not long, 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 long suffering. And it's gotten to be long, long, long suffering. <laughs> the third, fourth one is love. Do people look at you and look at me? And can they see the love of God in us? You see, that's what unifies the church, is love for each other. And by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. That's what Jesus said. How important is that love? It's everything. Oh, well, I'm, I've got the gift of this, or I've got the gift of that. Well, you can have all the gifts, but if you don't have love, you're nothing but a loud noise. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> and love's not a gift. Love's a fruit. Love's what's produced by us. Are you very loving? I told y'all recently about a guy in my last church who was a great Bible teacher, but he, had, he didn't have an ounce of love in his whole body. I'm talking, he could be a Bible teacher, but he couldn't, he wasn't going to win anybody by love. And he told me that, so I'm not just saying that. He said that was his weakness. How important it is. And then last of all, peace. One of the things that ought to mark us is there ought to be a peace that passes all understanding in our lives. It goes on there in verse 3, or the end of, in verse 3, it says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In the bond of peace. Wow. Characteristics of the church. The character of the church. Who, who, who am I talking about? The church. That's us, isn't it? That's us, isn't it? The, Paul, in writing to the church at Ephesus, was, I, I know there, there must have been issues of division within that church. That must be why he was writing this. And, and I want to thank you that here we don't see a lot of that. I, I want to thank you for that. And, but Paul must have been, he was challenging them because he knew they had to hold together against the world because all the false religions that were in Ephesus, he knew that if, if there was the least crack in the church, that the devil would use that to destroy them. Man, they had to hold the bond of peace in their church. And so he challenges them. All right? Let's look at verse 4. The commonality of the church. The commonality. <clears throat> I'm sorry. No, that was verse. Yeah. Number 3, but it begins with verse 4. All right. He said they should be one body. They should be one body. Why is that important? What's important about being one body? The unity, yeah. Think about the body, though. If you're trying to, if 
you're trying to feed yourself a, a bowl of a cereal and some of your fingers are going like this and your, your wrist wants to do its own thing and the hand wants to do its own thing and you're trying, to, you're trying to hold on to a spoonful of cereal and get it up to your mouth and then your mouth doesn't want to open when it's supposed to open. And, and you think about it, the body's got to work together. We're all members of one body, Paul said in writing to Corinthian church. That, that it's so important that we function in rhythm. <clears throat> Someone said it this way. If you take an orchestra, now Brother Whalen may disagree with this, but you pull a few of those instruments out in that orchestra. Brother Whalen, the French horn. It's ugly. It don't sound pretty by itself. I mean, I mean, it just, it just, clarinet, bless her heart. Now, there's just a few instruments, and in. when you play them individually, they don't sound as good. But boy, when you put them in an orchestra, they sound great. They sound great, and that's the way the ministry is. That's the way the body of Christ is. Is we've got to work. We've got to function together. In Paul, in writing to Corinth, he talked about the, the foot. And the hand, what if the foot and the hand don't want to work together? What if, the, what if the big toe says, I don't want to be a big toe anymore. I want to be a thumb on the left hand. We got a problem, don't we? <laughs> we, we got a problem if the big toe wants to be on the left hand as a thumb. And that's what happens sometimes. That's what happens sometimes. Well, I don't want to do this, God. I want to do that. Or I don't want to do nothing. Some of us just want to be a paralyzed part of the body. We just want to sit there and do nothing. Carry a title and do nothing. Amen. We want the recognition. We just don't want the responsibility. <laughs> so he says the things that we have in common, we're one body. We're one spirit is the next one. He, how important that is that we understand that we're to be, there's just one spirit that guides us. I, I've often said this. Have you ever heard anybody in a church, they would vote no. If everybody else voted yes on something, they would vote no. You know why? They'd say, well, somebody's got to vote no. No, they don't. In fact, if 100% of the people if 100% of the people are in touch with God, guess what the vote's going to be? 100%. Now, I don't, I don't mean right or wrong. The 1% might be right, and the 99% might be wrong. I'm just saying God's not divided 90 to 10, amen, in His will. God's not divided. It's only us that gets divided. And I say all that to say this. Following the Spirit's leadership. There's just one Spirit that pulls us all together. One Holy Spirit that pulls us all together. And He's the one we listen to. He's the one who should guide us. He's the one that should calm us. He's the one that teaches us the deep things of God. We're going to talk about some deep things here when we get in our last section after break tonight. We're going to talk about what happened to Jesus after He went to the grave. But the Spirit, being in touch with the Spirit, being in touch with the Holy Spirit of God. What does the Holy Spirit do for us? Y'all just list me some things. What the Holy Spirit does, I want you to wake up. Think with me here now, okay? He convicts of sin. What else? He, 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 he does what on truth? He helps us to see and learn the things of God. Eyes not seen, ears not heard. The things God has prepared for those who love Him. Amen? Yeah. Who else said something over here? Teaching. teaching. How does He help with teaching? Okay. Helps us understand it ourselves. And then even the delivery of it. The anointing of what we teach. That's what you were going to say? What else? Think about all the things the Holy Spirit does. He calms us, comforts us, okay? He intercedes for us. Daniel? Okay. What else? Come on, there's a whole list. We could take a long time. 
discernment. He helps us discern, to test the spirits, whether they're of God or not. Right? So I need to be able to discern when somebody says something, is that of God? How, do, how does he, what's the Holy Spirit going to do then? We talked about him revealing truth. If, if he's going to help me discern truth, where's he going to go with me? Where's he going to take me? <laughs> he might tell us to shut up sometime, right? But then he's going to take us to the Word. Okay, what you heard, is that supported by the Word? Or does that... Is it contradictory to the Word? Because God's not going to tell you to do something that's contradictory to the Word. He's just not going to do it. Really, the Holy Spirit, and that's where we get the fruits of the Spirit, the love and the joy and the peace and the gentleness and the meekness and the self-control and all those things. There's just so many things the Holy Spirit does, isn't it? I love when Jesus said, He'll not speak of Himself. He will speak of me. He'll point to me. Wow. You know, there have been a lot of conferences the last 30, 40 years that have tried to, tried to highlight the Holy Spirit almost ahead of Jesus, ahead of God. You know, it's all about the Spirit. It's all about the Holy Ghost, you know, and this and that. I'm here to tell you, it's all about Jesus, folks. It's all about Jesus. That's right. So there's just a lot of things that the Spirit, we, but we've got to function with that one Spirit. You don't get a different spirit than I got, all right? And he's not going to tell you something different than he tells me. Now, we may take a verse of Scripture, and you get something out of it, and it's true. And I get something else out of it, and that's true too. It may be more than one application of that Scripture, but those things shouldn't contradict each other, all right? All right, one hope. He talks about hope after that. He says, uh, one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Why is hope? How does, how does God give us? What, what is the hope of God? What is this hope? Do you have hope? The Bible tells us to be ready to, to tell the hope that is within you. Right. Give a reason for the hope that's within you. That's right. That's right. But what is that hope? in Jesus Christ. It's what He's done for us on the cross. All right? Thinking about heaven and, and the, the, what's ahead of us. You know, because we have hope, we don't have to be afraid of death. Jesus has already conquered death. We're going to conquer death in the grave. Because, and why do I have hope? I have hope because Jesus has already paved the way. He's already gone before me. He was the first fruits the Bible says he was the first fruits of a coming great resurrection. That's you and I. He was just the one that went ahead of us and paved the way. So the Bible's been real clear. Have hope because Jesus has overcome this world. And you can overcome the world. I'm going to tell you, if you get negative, if you get this negative mindset, I'm here to tell you the world will eat you up. If you forget that you have hope in Christ, and without that hope, the Bible says you're of all men most miserable. Most miserable. One Lord. We just got one, don't we? One Lord. His name is Jesus Christ. What's the word Lord mean? It's the word Adonai in Greek. What's it mean? It means he's the boss, he's the king. He's the one making all the calls. There's no one else. There's no one else to look to. There is no other Lord to turn to. He is the Lord, the boss, the master. That is who Jesus Christ is. And you know, you can get... There's a lot of discussion about whether you can accept Jesus as your Savior and not have Him as your Lord. And I have a hard time believing you could actually accept him. Just, I just want him to save me, but I don't really want to follow him. I'd have a hard time believing that. But I do think that lordship is something that's learned. It is something that you don't get it all. I mean, if you're, I was an eight-year-old kid when I got saved. I didn't understand everything about lordship. I didn't. I knew I wanted him to be lord of my life, 
but knowing that I want him to be and really learning to let him be is two totally different things. So we, at least you have to have that desire for him to be Lord of your life. And then you learn how to live that out over time. But yeah, he's got to be the boss. One faith is the next one. We have to have one faith. Oh, when I think about that and I think about the, how many people today say that, that whatever faith you have, it doesn't really matter, just have faith in something. No. Well, just have faith, even if, if your faith, this new, listen, the Bible says we have to handle the faith that was handed down to us. The Bible says in, in the little book of Jude that we're to contend for that faith. But not only is it the faith, it is faith like I just went through the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, talking about how to live that faith. How to actually let that faith change your life. Faith is so important. Faith is so important for you and for me because... It's what makes the difference. It's much like hope that we just mentioned a little earlier. One faith. Our faith is in Jesus Christ, what He did for us. But it is also the faith. I don't just have faith in some kind of set of beliefs. There is a faith that's been handed down to us. And it's found in the Word of God. And so important is that faith to us. One baptism, he says. He goes on and, she, and he talks about that understand that there's one baptism. I, um, there's all kind of teachings out there about baptism, and I'm not going to get off into all of those teachings, but I do want to say to you that the Bible tells us uh, over in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free, have all been made to drink into one spirit. But just an emphasis right there on the fact that for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Who's he talking to there? He's talking to the Christians at the church at Corinth. How that when they got saved, salvation means God baptized, taking them from outside the world and taking them and baptizing them into the body of Christ. A spiritual baptism that takes place. And when that happens, you don't get part of God. You don't get some of God. You get all of God. All of God's made available to you. Now, you may not live it. You may not use all that you know. You may be one of those who suppress a lot of the, the things of God. You may be one of those that quenches the Holy Spirit sometimes in your life. But some people teach that you get saved and then down the road you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and different things happen. No, there's just one baptism. It's just one baptism into the body of Christ. Now, learning how to live that, learning what that means. Now, there's a difference here. We're talking about water baptism or we're talking about the baptism into the body of Christ. Okay? Okay. There's one's a literal baptism, the other one's a spiritual baptism. But my point being is that it's not like you, you, you get baptized over and over again to get the Holy Spirit. There is one baptism that unites us. And I believe he's talking about that one there in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. How you've been baptized by the, by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. Okay? That's something that happens the moment you place your faith in Jesus Christ. Doesn't happen later, happens then. Now, do you always do the right things? Do you always walk in the Spirit? Do you always fulfill the, the desires of the Spirit? Or do you catch yourself sometimes battling with letting God have His place? 
Yeah, sometimes you do. Does that mean you'll always be the, best, the perfect Christian? You'll always walk in the fullness of the Spirit? No, you don't. I think what a lot of times is confusing to people, I think what happens in a lot of people's life, I think they get saved. I think, I believe the Bible teaches that they get saved. They receive the Holy Spirit when they get saved. You don't get the Holy Spirit later. You receive the Holy Spirit when you get saved. But it's like you can only, you can only take so much. You can only learn so much at a time, if you will. Okay, I'm saved now. I've been baptized by the Spirit of God into the family of God. Okay, now I'm trying to learn how to let Jesus be Lord in my life. And somewhere he, it comes along the place when you've learned. Now, when you, got, when you were a baby, and you got, or by that baby I mean seven, eight, nine years old like I was, and you got baptized, you didn't, you didn't understand everything about how to let Jesus be Lord in your life. But I didn't get the Holy Spirit later. I had Him all this time. It just took me a while to learn how to live for Him. I think a lot of us, if we could look back at our lives, I think we may find out that we got saved in a place, but we really became full and filled with the Spirit of God at a later point in our life when we really surrendered everything to God. And we really learned how to, just, how to live out our faith. We didn't know that early on. We didn't understand all that early on. Show me one person. In the, is anybody in this building, the day you got saved, you knew everything? You lived a perfect life at that point. from that point on. You didn't have any more struggles. Anybody here? Roxy, am I waiting on her? Waylon said, Roxy, you need to raise her hand. <laughs> the fact is, it's not a second event. It's not a second event that happens in your life. It's just coming to a fullness and an understanding of what's happened in your life. And learning how to let go and let God have His way in your life. You ever wonder what your story is going to look like when you get to heaven? <laughs> God, could I kind of see that memo about my life? I'd like to look at the outline. Okay, I got saved. Oh, I didn't get saved when I was 13? Oh, God... <laughs> God says, no, you got saved when you were 19. In that revival meeting, you know, you, you just said you came up and just recommitted your life to the Lord. And he said, let me tell you something, buddy. He said, that night you got serious about God. I'm just, I'm just using that for an example. That could happen. That could happen. It could be when you got serious about God. We don't fully understand it all, do we? I was telling somebody this past week, I said, man, it'd be great. I said, I don't care what happens. I said, but from talking to that person, I could tell that they were, they were, had, were unsure about their life. There was no Christian fruit in their life. And, and in talking to that person, I said, dude, if you walk out of my office right now without trusting your life to Jesus Christ, I guarantee you you're walking out of this office uncertain whether you're saved or not. Because all you've told me is you think you're going to heaven because you got baptized when you were nine years old. Even though you have lived like the devil for the last 20 years. Does that make sense to you? And he was in agreement that what probably what happened to him at nine wasn't real. And he needed to make it real. Because his life needed to change. And it never had changed. But I don't think God's offended. It's, say this person gets to heaven, and God says, No, son, you were saved back there when you were nine, but man, you were saved by the skin of your teeth. I mean, you just barely. Thank the Lord. I, I can hear God say, Man, I'm so glad you came back and nailed that down and got that right with God. I was going to let you in, but man, wouldn't have been any rewards for you. But guess what now? There's going to be some rewards waiting on you when you get there because your life changed. I don't know. I don't fully understand all that. All I know is what the Bible says. The Bible says we're all part of one baptism. Um, and we'll look at this last one. Uh, part of one God and Father. Um, verse 6. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Wow. 
to think that we could be one with God the Father. To think that we would have His Spirit and access to His presence. What a, what a challenge to live up to that. All right. Anybody have a question or comment before we break? 6.15. Daniel? Right. And I think there's a lot of times people get make decisions and there's no repentance in their life. And again, a lot of that's got to do with age and children and different understandings. But uh, let's stand and we'll, we'll have a prayer. Uh, Todd, would you pray for us and just give a thanks for the food next door? The Christ of the church... Uh, we all know there's just one Christ of His church. Let's talk about a few things here. Verse 7 says, we left off after 6. Verse 7 says that He gave us grace. One of the things He gave us. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. All right? Probably nothing greater Jesus could have given us other than grace. Grace is grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we do deserve. Grace is is uh, God's riches at Christ's expense. Another little acrostic for it. But we've been given that grace. Second thing I want you to talk about. He gave us. The grave. He conquered the grave. That's right. He conquered the grave. What a victory that is. I mean, that sounds very simple, but it's nothing simple about it, is it? Uh, he conquered the grave so we could conquer the grave. And this is where I was going to expound on this one a little bit. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. And gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens. That he might fill all things. And we know that last part, don't we? Who, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all, above all the heavens. We know that's talking about the ascension, when Jesus ascended back to the Father. The part we don't always know a lot about is this descending. Uh, how that He uh, led captivity. It talks about when he had ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Um, and it, the discussion in verse 9 is really in verse 9 when it says he ascended. What does it mean by that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? I want to take some time here and pause and just kind of highlight something I talked about last week in our discussions there, what does that mean? When it tells us here, Paul tells us that in writing to the church at Ephesus, something unique, why would he include this in here? He's talking about church unity and church character. And here he talks about what Christ has done for us. This is all part of his conquering the grave um, and his victory over the grave. I'll give you four quick things that it may mean. First of all, Perhaps it's a reference to the burial of Jesus, and it refers to the grave. When it just talks about He was, he was placed you know, in the earth. I mean, we know He was actually laid in a tomb, uh, a hewn out, hewn out of a rock, with a, and then a stone was rolled over the gate. So I don't really think it's talking about He was buried down in the ground, but that's one possibility. 
Perhaps it's a second thing. Perhaps it's a reference to his incarnation into the world. When he left heaven, he descended into the world. And it's simply stating that Jesus just came to the earth. Well, if he'd have just come to the earth, uh, I don't think it would have been called the lower parts of the earth. I don't think it would have been a reference to uh, uh, something special and, and leading captivity captive. What does that mean? So I'm not sure. I don't think it's just talking about him leaving heaven and coming to the earth. Maybe it's a reference, number three, to the humiliation of Jesus in dying with all the sins of mankind placed on him and being put to an open shame. Some have referenced that. That it's just a picture of the, the spiritual uh, downer that it was when all of the sins of all of mankind was placed upon his back, upon his head. I don't think he's talking about that. But the next one I'd like to tell you, which I think it is, and I, you know, I try not to be too dogmatic with this, but if I had to come to an understanding, this fourth interpretation is what I believe based on the Scriptures, and I'm going to point out some of those Scriptures if you want to write them down. And you can go back and read it some more on your own. But you're, you're here to learn, and this I don't want to just skip over this. All right? So what's it talking about? Well, write down, you've got your graph. You may want to keep this handy because you see the compartments down there in the bottom. You have paradise and hell and a great gulf fixed between them. There, that great gulf in Luke 16, verses 19 to 31 it's a story about the rich man and Lazarus. You remember that story, don't you? And it was kind of unique in this, uh, this story. We see that they could even look at each other, see each other, talk to each other. The rich man and Lazarus, they talked to each other, didn't they? They said The, ri the rich man said, Lord, just send, just send old Lazarus. Let him dip his finger in, in the water and come touch my tongue and just cool my tongue and Abraham said, no, that's not. That was also believed, referred to as Abraham's abode or uh, in the bosom of Abraham, if you will. All right. So we have that story about the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, and he says there in verse 26 in that story that there's this great gulf fixed between them. Clarence Larkin, who wrote this, who did this chart, did several great charts just to give you a visual. I don't know about you, but when I can see it, I can understand it a little better than just reading it. And I think he did a good job to help us have a visual understanding. You see paradise on the left side there. Again, we don't know which side it's on. All we know is Jesus told the thief on the cross that day, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Is paradise heaven? Some would think that it probably is heaven. I think it would become heaven. I don't think it was on that day. Then you see the hell is the abode of the souls of the wicked dead. If you can't read all those wordings there, you can magnify them. Some people told me that on your phone, on your cell phone, it's got a magnifying glass on it. You can actually use your phone and it'll magnify that on the screen for it. I don't know. But uh, get you a magnifying glass at the house so you can read it a little bit better. But one of the things you see is it talks about that cross on the left up there. It says the penitent thief came down there. Christ came down there after his death and uh, came down there and preached to the captive spirits. Let's talk about that next. Do you see Tartarus down there below at the bottom? This is uh, another word for the underworld. Tartarus is the, another reference. The word literally means the underworld. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 is one of the verses that speaks of, of this particular place. If you want to look there, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. Listen to what it says. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Did not spare, he didn't spare the ancient world in the days, but, but saved Noah. But what's he talking about there when the, the demons that were cast down? Well, if, if I understand it right, Jude verse 6 basically talks about the same thing. The little book of Jude talks about those that were cast down into a holding place 
Well, it's believed that that's probably what this underworld or Tartarus is speaking of. In the little book of Jude, in verse 6, it says this about that place. It says, And the angels who did not keep their proper abode, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So what's it talking about, this holding place? Well, you remember I I preached here some months ago on Genesis chapter 6, and the, the angels that that came down, or it's believed the demons, I don't necessarily mean angels, I mean the fallen angels, that came down and they, they mixed with the women on the earth. It's in Genesis chapter 6. And what was born of them was called the Nephilim. Nephilim. And in Hebrew, we don't have a good word to, a, to really relate in the English language to Nephilim, but we know it was some strange beings. And... It's not real sure, obviously, the angels were involved in this, or whether even some of the Nephilim may be in, in, imprisoned there. But it's a reference to the fact of the place of the Holy. When it talks about those angels that had fallen, uh, is a reference to, let me see how it said that again. Uh, well, I'm looking at the wrong page. But basically, a holding place for them until a time of a future coming judgment of them. I believe what that's a reference to is when Jesus died on the cross. I'll give you some more verses about that. His body was placed in the grave. The Bible says his body, he died in his body, but his spirit was made alive. So something went on during that three-day period that he was there in the tomb. And in that process, I believe what he did, he went down and proclaimed judgment over those imprisoned spirits. Some say, well, he went down there and preached to them. No, he didn't give those fallen angels another chance to be saved. He went down there and proclaimed victory to them. Let me give you some verses that go along with that. 1 Peter 3, 18. 1 Peter 3, 18 says this. For Christ also suffered once for the sins, for the just, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, and being put to death in the flesh, being made alive by the Spirit. Now most people believe that that's the place when he died in his flesh, his Spirit came alive, and he had ministry to do during those three days that Jesus Christ's body lay in the tomb. Now, the Bible tells us in the very next verse, You'll look at that, verse 19, by whom, talks about when his spirit came alive, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about when Jesus' spirit came alive in the spirit, he went down there and proclaimed victory to them. Why do I say proclaimed victory? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, if you read verses 54 and 55, write that down. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55, it says that death, remember that? We use it at funerals a lot. Death is swallowed up in victory. And oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? And so we have those verses that talk about that. And then Revelation 1, 18, right at the beginning of the book of Revelation, it talks about how Jesus, is a, he said, I am alive and was dead. And he said, I have the keys of death and hell in my hand. Revelation 1.18. Revelation 1.18. Mm-hmm. And it's, a, it's just another reference how that Jesus rose from that grave. He had the keys to hell. He did something that set the captives free there in hell. Uh, and I think it's a reference to in the underworld, I should say. I believe... Well, that's what paradise was, you see. Uh, I was going to come back to that, but what paradise is, paradise was the place of the, of the righteous dead. It was the place where you went. It was much like heaven, except they couldn't go into heaven until their sins had been totally paid for. When did that happen? Hebrews talks about that. We've been studying Hebrews 
But if you look back to chapter 9 of Hebrews, now this is, this is, they who, all the, yeah, those that were in paradise. Uh, let, me, let me finish, I'll explain that to you. Look what it says in Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. In other words, he's talking about a tabernacle in heaven, not a tabernacle on earth. He says, not with the blood. He's talking about when Christ went to that tabernacle, not with the blood of goats and calves like they did in the Old Testament, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And so it's believed that the reference there is talking about when Jesus ascended back to the Father and he placed his blood on the mercy seat of heaven and that and then our sins had been paid for. And that was why you may remember when Jesus came out of the, came out of the tomb. You remember when he came out of the tomb? Who was there at the tomb? Mary was there. Which Mary? Mary Magdalene. You remember what you remember what she tried to grab a hold of him and you remember what he said? He said, Don't touch me, I've not ascended yet to my father. It's believed was a reference to that Jesus was about to ascend to the Father, place his blood on the mercy seat of heaven, and therefore the sins of man would have been redeemed. All right? And somewhere in that process, I don't fully understand the timetable, none of us would. Uh, we know later on he he appeared to his uh, to the disciples behind closed doors. Uh, what a unique experience that must have been. How did he go through the walls to his disciples uh, other than he was in his glorified body, his resurrection body? But if you look at that story, somewhere there, it's believed when Jesus said to the thief on the cross, this day you'll be with me in paradise. But it's believed that after his resurrection, after the blood had been placed upon the mercy seat, then he went to paradise and cleaned out paradise. Because Romans says, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, it says, second, I'm sorry, I said Romans, it's 2 Corinthians 5, 8. It says, after Jesus' death and resurrection, it tells us that now believers go where? They go to be in the presence of the Lord, don't they? It says to be absent from this body. What'd you ask? Yes, ma'am. I believe I believe paradise at this point is empty because when a person dies today, they go immediately in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That was not the case before they went to paradise. Now, a lot of people, you probably like me for years, I just thought paradise and heaven the same place. But I do believe they're different. Uh, I believe paradise is real close to heaven. But anyway, it helps us understand a little bit more. I'm just briefly touching on that. But it helps us understand a little bit more what the Bible says when it means here in Ephesians 4, 8, that he led captivity captive, uh, that he, we know from uh, uh, 1 Peter 3, how that he went and he proclaimed victory over those enemies of God. You see, Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, I mean, folks, that was victory over the devil. I mean, at that point, the devil who thought he would defeat him now was understanding that he didn't have a hope. And, and that he had been, victory was declared over him. So when it says that he preached to those spirits there, it wasn't that he gave them a chance to be saved. It was that he was proclaiming victory. And that was their judgment. I believe when he said earlier that they're going to hold being held there till the judgment, that was their judgment when Jesus died on that cross and rose from the dead. It was all over for them. So, uh, just briefly touching on that, uh, that's as clear as dirt, I'm mud for some of you, I'm sure. But notice there the lake of fire on the right side. Now, hell is going to hold the dead until they appear before the great white throne of judgment. You notice on your chart, hell, it holds the wicked souls 
uh, and they won't leave hell until they go up to be to stand before God, Jesus Christ, at the great white throne of judgment. And from the great white throne of judgment, they'll then be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. And that's what you see down at the bottom when it says the lake of fire. Uh, uh, it's, it's definitely a place like now. I mean, you look at the rich man and Lazarus. I mean, <laughs> the rich man was tormented. He was tormented. So not much. Not, I don't know the difference other than one being called hell, which is the, play, the abode of the wicked and the lake of fire. Uh, I would just assume probably worse than hell, you know, or worse than hell. But we know there are different levels of hell. Boy, don't give me, I don't want to get you all started in that. There are different levels of torment. Jesus said that. He said, if some people had had the evidence that you had, they would have repented. And he said, hell's going to be more tolerable for them than it is for you. Because you had chance after chance after chance. And they would have repented had they seen what you've seen. It's still going to be bad. But for some folks, it's going to be worse than others. That's called the bottomless pit. Revelation talks about that when the bottomless pit opens up. And, uh, yeah. yeah, that's the beast. Yeah, that's the beast in the bottomless pit, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the earth that's the part the abyss is what where the earth opens up in Revelation and it says that things in the bottomless pit come up and ascend up to the earth from the bottomless pit. I don't remember the verse, I didn't look it up, but it's in Revelation. And that's what it's a reference to. Okay? Now, is this Bible? No, this isn't Bible. But at least it gives us an idea kind of what it's like, kind of what the Bible's talking about. Am I going to say this is inerrant? No. But at least gives us a picture of pretty close what, it, what God was talking about. Pretty close picture. Okay? Anybody have a question? I gave this to you to take home and study it if you want to, if, it, if that, thing, that interests you at all. But I didn't want to just be one of those that just skips over it because it's tough. And didn't, didn't address it when we were there in Ephesians chapter 4. Even discussed part of that in Ephesians chapter 3. But uh, do I fully understand it all? Am I dogmatic about it? No, I'm not. But I do think it's worth looking at, at least having some knowledge of. Okay? So he conquered the grave. Go ahead, Miss Brenda. Mm -hmm. Well, when they took him and placed him in the grave, the Bible just right there just says that his body, he died in the flesh, but he became alive in the spirit. And his spirit is what went down and preached to the imprisoned spirits in hell. That's right. And then he ascended from that and took the captives from paradise and moved them to the presence of the Lord. You know, after his blood was placed on the mercy seat in heaven. Okay, it's kind of a process how that all figured into those three days. I don't know. I don't know how long it takes to clear out paradise and move people to heaven. I don't know, but it it it, it didn't take long, did it, Danny? <laughs> but we don't know it all. But we, I'm just sharing with you what we know, what what parts that we know. All right, number three. Let's look at that on this part here. Uh, Bible says here that he, uh, uh, he empowered us with gifts. And it's talking about spiritual gifts, isn't it? It's talking about the spiritual gifts. It says in verses 11 and 12, And he gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. He just lists five of them there. Some people teach that if you read over in Corinthians and in Romans 12, both of those in chapters 12, that it's a longer list, like 12 or 13 different gifts. Here it's only five. Some people believe and teach that a lot of the gifts were temporary and began to pass away. And at this point, when Paul wrote to Ephesians, that there were only five left. To me, that's a big jump. I don't think the Scripture says that. You can assume that. 
I don't know if it's just giving us a partial list here or if this is all that's left at this time. We know that some of the gifts we're going to see, some were meant for certain times and certain purposes. Uh, but here he at least lists some of the gifts, and he says what they're for. They're for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, you'll run across some translations that say equipping of the saints, comma, for the work of the ministry, comma. And really, it should not, because the purpose of spiritual gifts is to prepare people like you and me to do ministry, okay? It's not separating the gifts from, from ministry. It's for us to do ministry. And uh, by the way, I, I could probably look at some of these and uh, it's believed that apostles is no longer a gift. Why? No, to be an apostle, you had to walk with Christ on the earth. You had to literally walk by Him. You had to be one of His. Paul was one born out of time, the Bible says. Yeah, and he was a Gentile, called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. So really nobody could be, nobody really could be an apostle today. Not with the biblical definition of what an apostle is. Uh, some have even argued, I've heard some argue that the prophets, in the sense of an Old Testament prophet who didn't have the Holy Spirit and God gave him direct revelation and he realized to people that even prophets has probably passed away. And some have uh, actually, I've heard taught that only, only evangelists and pastors and teachers are the only three gifts really left in the church. I, I just don't know if, I, if I'd agree with all that because I think there's even the gift of giving the Bible talks about and the gifts of, of administrations. And uh, there's a lot of different gifts that we use. Some things we call gifts aren't really gifts. Like I've heard people say the, the gift of being able to sing. Well, no, that's not listed in the Bible anywhere. Uh, that uh, sometimes comes from a lot of hard work and learning how to sing. But, but the gifts. So he gave us, Christ of the church gave us, empowered us with gifts. That is the Listen, the Bible talks about the gift of grace. Every one of us should be gracious. But some people just supernaturally have an extra double portion of grace. You ever met people like that? Make me sick. No, I'm, no, I'm joking. <laughs> they never get mad about anything. You can't make them get mad. <laughs> no, but it's... Uh, there are a lot of gifts like that. These are supernaturally magnified, if you will, gifts. Grounded, that he tells us, he challenged us to be grounded in the Word of God, 13, 14. Um, he wanted us to be a people, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, well, we got that today, don't we? In the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But in other words, he wants us to be grounded. To be grounded in the things of God. I mean, not you're one thing one day and something else. You're shooting off in another direction the next day. And the next day you're over here. And the next day you're doing this or that. But to get grounded and be steadfast and unmovable, the Bible says. And then number five, grown up. He wants to see, charges us to grow up, verses 15 and 16. Here's what that means. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ. Stop right there. Speaking the truth in love. We have to speak the truth, but we have to try to do it in love. Sometimes we speak the truth, but we don't do it very lovingly, do we? Do we? We can do it pretty harshly. And verse 16, From whom the whole body, it's all of us, joined and knit together by whatever, jo what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. For the edifying of itself. What's the word edify mean? It means to build up. For the building up of this body in love. That's what Paul was after. He was after them being a, uh, not a little, uh, 
not the three little pigs story where, where one's a house built with straw and the big bad wolf blows it down, but instead to be a brick house, one that's solid. And when the devil comes against it, it doesn't just get blown all to pieces. It stands strong through the attacks of the enemy. Amen? All right. Well, we didn't quite finish chapter 4. Uh, so we're going to try to figure out how to do all that. And actually, we're supposed to have, we got two more Sunday nights before the revival starts. And so uh, we'll uh, see how we can work on that, see how I can try to twist all this together. And I tell you, there's a lot of good stuff on husbands and wives and family in chapter 5. So anyway, we'll see where this goes. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed. Father, as we close tonight, we thank you for our chance to study your word. Father, help us to, to be this church that we've read about tonight. To be this body of believers. To be this unified. To be this focused on our purpose and our mission. To be this gifted of a church. To be this grounded of a church. And God, help us to go out into our world and make a difference to not let the world make a difference in us but let us make a difference in the world and it's in Jesus name we pray amen amen you're just dismissed